flawless experts who have all the answers? <laughs> That's not this podcast. Instead, we chat with professionals who love what they do, have wisdom to share, and can laugh at their own mistakes. I'm Mark, and I'm the host of the Workplace Solutions Podcast. So let's laugh, learn, and discover the joy of work. Boo, boo, boo. All right. We are back with Dr. Jim Kane for part two of our conversation about extraordinary facilitation and the loads of books and books and books that he has authored and co-authored over the years in his career of being a facilitator, trainer, game maker, upper guru, experiential <laughs> learning professional, all of that. So, so very excited to carry on our conversation with Jim. So welcome back, Jim. Mark, thank you. You, uh, you're very kind, sir, and I appreciate uh, <laughs> an opportunity just to share. I, I, Mark and I were mentioning in, during the break here just how grateful I am, and not only for the profession at large that I love and enjoy participating in, but I've had some extraordinary co-authors over the years, people who were really fun and engaging and, and, um, and wonderful to work with. And because of that, I, I've grown. I, I will share with you, I have about 20,000 books in my house, um, mostly Ooh. on the subjects of teaching, training, facilitation, group activities, and things like that. Some in languages that I can't read. It's a good thing they have pictures. But but the thing I, I like most about that is that I have probably learned more from the co-authors and the co-facilitators that I've worked with than the sum total of all the books I've read. And, and mm. I've read a lot of books. So it just shows you the value in working with other professions. In fact, I'll just share with you, Mark, early on, most of my early books all had co-authors for them. And I often thought that people who wrote team building books but didn't have a co-author, they, they weren't really walking their talk and they couldn't work with somebody <laughs> else on writing a book. I'm not sure their advice on team building was going to be all that great, but um, but there's been some phenomenal books out there. And 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 not only um, co-authors, but people like Sam Sykes and Chris Cabot and Michelle Cummings and other people who are just innovative in the profession have influenced the way that I do things. We have kind of a mutual admiration society where we all get together and we occasionally input activities for other people's book projects and things like that. But at least for the foreseeable future, I think books are going to be a valuable part of this profession, mm -hmm. uh, whether they become all digital eventually, or they're still paper books in you know, 100 years, who knows? For now, it's kind of a nice place to be. Nice. Now, you mentioned you're a vor voracious reader. What's a typical how many books a year is that? I think I've um, topped 500 at my library. Um, yeah, it, probably in the range of 20 to 30 a week. And during the pandemic, it's probably been more than that. And, you know, some books you skim, but okay. <clears throat> some books I've read cover to cover. And, you know, there's always a new topic or a new twist of things. Um, social emotional learning came out a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And I was aware of that probably 10 years ago when Anchorage, Alaska was implementing it into all their schools. So I had some early insight into that. But it's been really fun to continuously look at all the different ways that people are coming together to write, to inspire. At this point in my career, I can pick up a, a, a children's playground book and mm -hmm. turn one of those activities into a corporate level activity. And I can pick up a corporate book like Who Moved My Cheese and make that accessible to fifth graders. So, you know, it's nice when you can morph the things you learn or apply them to your profession. If I can pick up a book and pull out a new activity, I'm feeling pretty good about it because at this point in my career, you know, I've got a, a fair repertoire of stuff. It's hard to come up with really fresh and innovative stuff, but it happens occasionally. And I didn't put this on the the preview questions, but now I'm really curious if you have, you know, 10,000 activities or whatever your your mental number is to choose from, how on earth do you pick? Here's the thing. I don't really create a curriculum for the programs. When I facilitate a group, they usually have a goal in mind. And I don't create a curriculum saying, I'm going to do this and then this and then this. Mm -hmm. I create a list of possibilities. And I constantly ask myself, what does my group need now? You know, where are they at? What have they got so far? So I think rather than creating a curriculum, having this openness to the possibilities that are out there and the answer to which activity, there's, there's two, in fact, uh, when facilitators <laughs> say, you know, what should I do now? Or what's the right activity to do? Mm -hmm. my, my first answer is always, you should do something you're excited about because mm. if you're excited, they'll be excited. And if you're not, they won't, you know, so first of all, do things you're excited about. If you have a choice between three activities 
and you're most excited about one, that's the one that I would do. And the second kind of answer of the same question is, you want to pick activities that are going to give you the teachable moment the group needs. Mm. You know, where, wherever they're at, wherever you need to get them to, whatever their goals are, if you have an activity that can assist them in that journey, then I think that's the right one to do. Speaking of a teachable moment, that might be a title of a book you've co-authored. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I got a phone call from Jennifer Stanchfield years ago. And Jen at the time was working at High Five in the Vermont area and has since gone off on her own and, and done amazing things in the debriefing and processing and reviewing world. And she said, you know, Jim, I think there needs to be a book that would do, you know, this kind of stuff. And I said, well, then you should write it. There's a, there's a great quote that says, if there's a book you want to read, but it hasn't been written yet, then you must write it <laughs> uh, by Maya Angelou. And uh, I just think the, actually, no, it was by Toni Morrison. So in that case, I kind of turned it back on her and she said, well, I'm not sure I could write a book. I said, well, you know, I'd be willing to help you, but who else should we get? And we thought, well, maybe, maybe Michelle Cummings would write this with us. And that phone call started, you know, a year long process of writing a teachable moment. And it was fun. We, we had lots of different titles for the book early in the in the uh, the title as is the case with most books that you write you kind of have a working title and then you discover what the book is all about along the journey and that becomes the the, the actual title of the book so a teachable moment came out of that experience and, and a year long process of doing that and I, I think it's fun because that that book is you know at, at least a decade old now but it's still a valuable book to show people the breadth and and the fact is we probably could write a second one equal to that size or bigger at this point with new ideas we've learned. But that's the, the innovative thing about this profession. People keep changing things and, and trying new things. And, you know, there's a lot more resources now available, including virtual facilitation and mm -hmm. some of those things. So that was a fun process. And a teachable moment was a great compilation of Michelle Cummings, Jennifer Stanchfield, and myself putting together resources. And what was really nice is, we each had a slightly different voice, but those voices were able to be blended together and provide things. So, you know, I may tend a little bit more on the technical side because that was part of my profession where Michelle had a chance to work with youth at risk audiences and some special needs groups. And that came out. So that, that's kind of the joy of working with co-authors and co-facilitators. Mm -hmm. They don't have the same blind spots that you have. They mm -hmm. see things that you don't see. And that's kind of valuable in my in my impression. Yeah, A Teachable Moment is probably the book in this industry that I have recommended more than any other book, uh, especially with folks who are learning the profession. So I wouldn't be surprised if that is required reading in many <laughs> training plans or <laughs> universities as well. Uh, love it. And speaking of, of Jen Stanchfield, I was just chatting with her at AEE, uh, just letting her know how thankful I am for her. I've attended so many of her workshops, you know, over the years and, and just realized just how much of an influence her style and culture of reflection and her methodologies have affected how I do what I do. And so just wanted to let her know how thankful I am for her and her influence on the industry and me personally. So, so thanks, Jen. Shout out. <laughs> Fun stuff. Golly, there's so many good things to talk about. Uh, <laughs> well, the, I'll tell you what, Mark, can I interject for a second? Can oh, I yeah, go ahead. What I'm currently working on? Yeah, you yes, please. Too. We, we're we're going to talk about books today, and uh, it always seems like I'm always working on something. But last year, on my birthday, I drew, drew the color artwork for a, a new book, which I eventually called The Adventure Trail, which was taking everything we do with group development, including Tuckman's stages of, of group development, the forming, storming, norming, and performing stages, and doing that not on a ropes course or in an instructional teaching environment, but out on the trail someplace in, in a green space, on, on the trail, in a park, in a field, you know, at a summer camp, at a college green. And the idea was to take a, a miniature expedition with the group um, and explore the stages of group development. So I've been working on that for the past year and then submitted it to the author about a month ago. So about the time this podcast goes live, in the spring, that book will be available on Amazon um, and the ACA bookstore. But it's a great way to take a look at the things we often do in an institutional setting, like a classroom or you know, in a conference room space or things like that. First of all, to get people outside again. And, and quite frankly, post-pandemic, people are pretty happy to be in the outdoor spaces. Mm -hmm. you know, so doing things like that, but also to provide some background so people can see the value I imagine summer camps might use this with a summer camp cabin, say, okay, here's our team. 
we're going to go out on this little miniature three hour expedition. When we come back, we're going to be a team. We're going to explore these stages and good things are going to happen. And I co-wrote that with Sean Moriarty. People know me in the team building world, but people know Sean in the nature and place-based learning world. Um, so he's exceptional when it comes to ecological practices and, and things to do in nature. And I first used Sean as a resource to provide some ideas. And then I realized I needed him as a co-author. So that's been a really fun project. And that'll be the newest thing that comes out. But prior to that, I wrote a thing last year that was just kind of fun. You know, during the pandemic, it wasn't easy to be out there in the world doing things. But one of the things I could do is write. So I happened to write nine different projects um, <laughs> during the pandemic, which here's the thing. It wasn't necessarily a great time, but I was prolific. You know, I was able to be productive and, and to do some things. The first book that I wrote during the pandemic was a 500 page novel based upon Stan Rogers song, the Mary Ellen Carter. Hmm. I, I talked to his widow and said, I think that song should be a book or a movie. Would you mind if I took that four minute song and turned it into a 40 chapter book? And I wrote about, you know, the story behind the song. And she said, that's a great idea. So I did. That, that was really fun. I had not written a novel before. And it was fun to do that kind of stuff. What's that novel called? It's called Rise Again, which is the chorus of the song about the Mary Ellen Carter by Stan Rogers. And it, it's available on Amazon. Okay. So you can find it there. But it's the coolest thing about it was we're always trying to find ways to innovate in our writing. I put QR codes in the book. So when you walk into the bar, there's a QR code. You can hear the music playing in the background. And I use a lot of Stan's music and other prominent Canadian folk singers. And that was really fun. The other cool thing about writing a novel is you have to make up names for all the people. So coming up with the various names of who these people were was really a fun talent. And, and, and different than my team building world, basically for a year and a half, I just made stuff up. You know, I just wrote, <laughs> you know, it's fiction, but it, what, what fun it was to put that together. And, and I bring that up not so much because I think all team builders need to read that book, but because the process of writing a novel mm. is different than it was writing like a, a, an activity book or things like that. I would sometimes wake up at three o'clock in the morning with an idea and come down and turn the computer on and start typing. And quite frankly, nobody else cares when you're awake at 2 a.m. But I was so <laughs> passionate about the content and the ideas came to me that way. It was just fun to work on it. And I had people reading it and offering advice for various things. And, and then I released the book in the first part of the pandemic. That, that was a great moment. The thing I did this, this past year was a lot of people, well, I'll put it this way. We, we all have uh, mortality to us. And at some point, I can't imagine I'll still be making timbering props and, and doing that kind of stuff. So I wrote a, a second book, a kind of a companion to teamwork and team play called The Team Builder's Toolbox that shows you how to make your own team building stuff. And I just thought, you know, this is kind of a, I'm not saying that I'm philanthropic or anything else I, I guess, or altruistic, but I wanted people to know how to do this kind of stuff. It's not rocket science. Mm -hmm. And here you can make these simple props and then use them. There you go. So that was fun. And the whole book is filled with like 70 different activities um, and it shows you how to make them. So it's a, about half craft book, half facilitation book, and just fun. Plus, it's it's my happy space. If you ask me what I do when I'm not out in the world facilitating or things like that, I have a woodworking shop here on my mm. on my site. And anytime I spend out there doing anything is is, is happy time. You know, I can be <laughs> making something on the lathe or you know just working with wood. It brings a lot of joy, and I only get to do it when I'm not busy with other things which means luckily during the pandemic, I had a lot of free time. So I got to do more of that kind of stuff. And it reminded me where joy comes from in my life. Hmm. And so books kind of take over your life a little bit when you're writing them. But in some ways, they introduce you as the author to new ways of thinking and doing. Um, it's just been a really fun process. Yeah, I'm curious, what advice would you have for folks that want to write their first book or are considering that? What would you tell the aspiring author? Well, I can, I can tell you the technique that works for me, realizing people have different things that work for them. I usually get a three ring binder uh, with a clear cover and I put some type of a working title and a graphic on the front page. You know, so that's my, that's my cover artwork, if you will. And that inspires me. And then I write the table of contents. I'm saying, okay, what is it I want people to know about by reading this book? Uh, and I put those things out there. And sometimes that grows because it's like, oh, I haven't, I haven't thought about this, or I just found out about this. Let's include that too. A good example is Extraordinary Facilitation. When I first wrote it, I didn't have any virtual stuff in there. And I added mm -hmm. a chapter specifically for that because it was an emerging field. Yeah. So I, the cover artwork and a working title, knowing it's going to change 
And then what I encourage people to do is when you write your table of contents, go out in the world and do a workshop on each of those items. Hmm. So if you have something in there about icebreakers, then go do a workshop on that. So you have a real life experience. I, I occasionally I'll pick up a book and I'll see people put together like some team building activities. And I wonder if they've ever actually done those activities or if they were a theoretical concept, mm. you know, I, I'd like to, <laughs> I, for the adventure trail, for example, Sean and I ran probably 15 of these sessions so far, even before the book came out, because we wanted to be, I guess right. We want to have street credibility. You know, mm -hmm. it wasn't a theoretical construct. It was proven. We did this and here's how it worked out. In fact, we put a case study in the book so people could say, here's how a typical group worked through this process. And you can too. And I think that was important um, to give people that, that assurance that what we're suggesting for you to do has actually happened before. I love that because I am both asking for our audience and curious myself because I do have plans to to write and publish at least one book at some point. And one of the things that I've been spending a lot of time on starting the summer was Medium, uh, which is a blogging platform. And so I've got 50 blogs out there. So just warming up my writing muscles and it's just fun. So Oh, no, uh, I agree. In fact, yeah. here's here's a couple more things. In your case, Mark, and I, I can even think of who these people are, you want to find an editorial board that will read your stuff because mm -hmm. after you've read it two or three times, you can't find the mistakes anymore. Mm. You, you, you can only read your own material so much. So find somebody who can read it for you. And, you know, typically, like in your case, you might pick your wife, for example, save her for the last version, <laughs> you know, just say, no, it's not ready yet, you know, because you want to have fresh eyes to look at that and you want to have people who can read you the riot act and you understand, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like, no, this is unclear. Here, here's an example. When we wrote teamwork and team play, I used the phrase, something was happening. I said, yeah, don't go there. And my co-author said, Jim, that, that phrase is popular now, but in 10 years, it's not going to be, you know, so let's, <laughs> let's use, you know, and I thought, okay, that that's valuable feedback. Those are things you can take. So having somebody who can read your work is important to do. And the other thing is I, I mentioned this, when you're typing at two o'clock in the morning, nobody else cares. So mm -hmm. you have to be so passionate about this thing that you have, you know, that you want to release to the world and put it out there in the world. But I, I read a book that was kind of influential for me in a way. It was called The Worldwide Rave. And they talked about giving things away for free. So after we had written the Raccoon Circle book, one of the things we did was we put it online and allowed people to download, you know, a handful of the Raccoon Circle activities. That was the first document I ever had that had more than a million downloads. Hmm. People from about 70 different countries, some that didn't speak English, downloaded that document. So yeah, we have a book out there, but by giving things away free, it kind of became part of the community. Hmm. When we named our processing book, A Teachable Moment, suddenly people started using the phrase teachable moments in their mm -hmm. workshops. And I thought, okay, we, we've actually, in some cases, influenced it. Years ago, people asked me, you know, what's going to happen next in team building? What's the next big thing going to be? And I had mentioned the idea of building connection, you know, as a process. And simply by saying it, to some extent, it came true. So mm -hmm. as authors, we can often lead the charge, if you will, to the trends and things that are happening out there. But I'm always grateful when I find somebody who goes off on a total tangent, but then kind of makes us feel a little less comfortable in our profession saying, well, Maybe that's a possibility. Here, here's a good example. I, I made a comment one time on a, uh, on a, on a web-based program that I thought escape rooms might become a new you know, element. Mm -hmm. And somebody said, well, no, because they're not facilitated. That's not part of what we do. And I thought, you know what? It kind <laughs> of is. So that kind of dissonance, I think, in the world, we're all going to get better at this kind of stuff. And occasionally people are going to propose things, both in books and on things like podcasts like this, that are going to challenge us, but I think it makes us stronger by being challenged that way and coming away with a vision for what we could be, not just what we are. Love that. That uh, it's funny you mentioned escape rooms. That is one of my upcoming projects to make a tabletop escape box that isn't lame, like the board game <laughs> escape rooms, uh, but is less gear intensive. I had made a portable escape room when I was still at Windshape uh, with a team of folks there, which was in this trunk, and you could set it up in any conference room on the planet and 
turn the entire room into a professional escape room. Right. Uh, I want to kind of scale that down and say, how do you do that same kind of experience on a table? So that is something in the 2023 uh, development queue for workplace solutions. All right. So we're, uh, I want to make sure I honor your time. So we've got time for a couple more questions. Okay. Spin the wheel of embarrassing moments. Tell us, <laughs> tell us a story of professional failure where you're the one who screwed up. And then what did you learn from it? <laughs> You know, in the book, Extraordinary Facilitation, I actually listed these things. Okay. <laughs> yeah. In fact, hold on here. There's a chapter here on page 301, epic mistakes I have made. Um, <laughs> and the phrase I got from a, a, a young person in my programs was, when you mess up, fess up. Mm. So uh, so I'm just going to kind of scan through here and see. Um, um, it, probably one of the early mistakes I made in my profession was I was invited to a corporate team building program. And I, again, created kind of a series of activities for people to engage in while they were there. And that was fun. Unbeknownst to me, the managers of this particular group, and there's about 80 people there. So there's probably 10 managers had tapped a keg um, in one of the pavilions <laughs> and had spent most of the afternoon drinking. And then we're going to go through this little modified team building course. And, and, and we had assigned points for, you know, successfully completing. And it was a nonsense amount of point. You got 10,000 points if this happened. Well, mm -hmm. You know, so here comes these inebriated managers out to do the program. And it, you could just tell th this is a bad combination. Alcohol and team building are not necessarily, you know, I, I think there's a, a social hour. Some groups do, mm -hmm. and that's appropriate. But in this case, it was a, like a perfect storm of bad ideas. Um, so I found the least ine inebriated member of the group and said, I'm worried about the safety of the group. Could you help me stop this now? And he's like, yeah, we'll, we'll do that. <laughs> um, so that was one of those moments early on. Let's see, I'm trying to think of, of and there's been many. Um, I was once invited, one of my my skills as a uh, as a facilitator is I know how to call square dances. Mm -hmm. So a local children's center um, that is basically a lock-in environment hired me to call a square dance for 60 urban youth the night after the rap singer was there. An influential <laughs> rap singer came and, and donated his time. So here I am. And, and because I had worked with the staff, uh, they usually have a six to one ratio, one staff member to six kids. But the staff had worked with me and said, oh, Jim will be fine. They gave the staff the night off. So this janitor opens the gym. Me and the kids go inside and then he locks the door. And for the next two hours, it's me and 60 urban youth. And, and the bottom line is I, I found myself in a situation where it's like, I'm not sure any of us wanted to be there. But we made something positive happen. And in the end, we did a little bit of dancing and some other stuff, but we ended up just having a great conversation. Um, hmm. And that was really fun. So I, I wrote in the book, Extraordinary Facilitation, I don't think it's the job of a facilitator to help the group be successful, but I think it's it's their job to help the group pull something valuable out, even when they fail. Hmm. And in that case, I just wanted to pull something valuable out of the experience. And, and those were good things to do. So. You know, here's the thing. I think if you're out there occasionally pushing the limits of our profession, you occasionally are probably going to make mistakes. Hopefully it won't be safety related, both emotionally and physically. But occasionally, if you're out there in this profession, you're going to make some mistakes. And when you do, I think the people in your workshop had a teachable moment that day. Why shouldn't you as a professor, you know, as, a, as somebody who's leading the group, you should have a teachable moment, too. So when those things happen, and a lot of times, you know, we're professionally embarrassed by them, but the fact is they're learning and growth experiences. And if you're on this trail, you're going to have a few of those. And by golly, I think you deserve it. Love it. <laughs> hey, Love can that. I share though, Mark, one of my favorite stories? So I was <laughs> asked one time to do a program for a major corporation. Some of you would recognize on the Fortune 500 and their, their supervisor said they had a toxic work environment. Could I come and help them? And I said, sure, but what's your plan? I mean, what would you like to see happen? What would a good day look like to you? And this fellow said, um, well, if nobody cried at work, that would be a good day. Cool. And I said, seriously? So I worked with them and here's the activity that had a major effect on them. We did a version of the memory game where you have 24 index cards on the ground. Two cards have words that match. You turn them over. If they match, you keep going. And we did a little competitive race there. But then we talked about the words that were on the card this group, you know how you do an activity maybe for 10 minutes and you debrief it for two, three minutes and you move on? 90 minutes later, this group is still talking about the activity. It was the most impressive afternoon and I had a great co-facilitator I was working with that day. But by playing the match game and the memory game, I mean, let's face it, the 24 index cards probably cost me less than a dollar. 
you know, to produce the props for this game. And it enabled this group to amass almost $2 billion. They could buy an Irish pharmaceutical firm that had a promising drug they wanted to annex into their portfolio. They went from being almost fired to sitting down with index cards for an afternoon and great things happen. So that's a case where it's one of those days when you look back and say, I'm so grateful that I have this as my profession, that I could experience that change in a group. And they often uh, will attest to this. They auto-corrected themselves. I didn't have mm-hmm. to intercede. I said, do you see the opportunity here? And I literally sat back and for an hour and a half, they processed what they'd been through and made positive changes. So I, I would wish that experience on everybody to have one day when you work with a group that just gets it, you know, and they embrace it and they see the potential in this field. It brings, I think, some credibility to what we do, but it just, I, I want days like that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> We already talked about some of the folks that have uh, that you've interacted with and supported you in your career. Is there anyone else you would want to thank while you have the opportunity? Well, every co-author I've ever had for starters, starting with Tom Smith when we wrote the book of Raccoon Circles, and Carl Ronke did the foreword for that book. You know, Michael Brandywine wrote the foreword for my essential staff training book. That was fun. I've had great collaborations with Chris Cavert and Sam Sykes over the years. When I first wanted to self-publish. I met Sam at his home and we went and bought software and we worked on it together and he showed me how to set everything up. Thanks for that, Sam, or I would not have written a lot of the self-published books and things that I have done. Boy, I, but all those folks and, and more, just you have to understand, even like yourself, Mark, the conversations and the things we had lead me in new directions and, and new things to consider. And the coolest thing is this, here's, here's an example. I'm working on a new book called Squeeze the Lemon that comes from one of the tips I put in the extraordinary facilitation book. And I'm inviting people to tell their story in the book of how they modified or tweaked something to make it even better. And, and I realize now this is important to also understand their creative process for how was that possible? Mm. Tom Hack, for example, came up with a great variation of an activity. And I said, how did you come up with that? And he said, oh, it was a necessity. I needed multiple groups to work together on something. And so I came up with that. So that's an example of how it came out of necessity. But if you want to be part of the Squeeze the Lemon project, um, you can email me, Jim Kane at teamworkandteamplay.com. Um, and we'll find a place for your voice and photographs to be in the book. Because I want to share not just my own words, but the collective wisdom of the greater community. And mm-hmm. that might be a fun way for people who maybe haven't had a chance to write or to be part of something like that, to be part of a project um, and have your words out there in the world where they can influence people. I love that. All right. What is a question I haven't asked you, but you're burning to answer? Boy, I probably have on my computer desktop right now, 10 different concepts for future writing projects. That could be books, um, that could be a PDF document I can put on the website, that might become a magazine article somewhere for a publication. And until I get excited about them, nothing happens. I mean, Mm -hmm. literally, there's books out there that I've gotten, you know, but if I don't have any energy about it, then I take it off my desktop after a week or two. It's just like, well, it didn't spawn anything. So, you know, maybe it's not the right book because it takes a lot of passion to actually deliver the content for a book. I mean, the Adventure Trail was fairly efficient from concept to final copy of about a year. That's a fairly efficient process. Mm -hmm. I've done some books and less, but they were a lot more concise than that book. But that's probably a reasonable thing to do is, is to find what you're passionate about. So when it comes to your time to write a book, I would encourage you to try, you know, different things and see which one kind of excites you. Mm-hmm. Because again, when you're excited about it, your words come out when your excitement is, is kind of spelled out there. If you're not excited about the project, don't expect other people to be. <laughs> <laughs> I'm noticing a theme there. <laughs> yeah, you know, the passion is so important. I, I just read a book um, recently called The Storytellers, um, and it lists all these prominent novel writers like Lee Child and um, uh, uh, David Baldacci and a bunch of other people like that. And it talks about what inspires them and how do they write and things like that. I think it's great. And, and most of them talked about the passion they have for writing. So I think if, if that's an element that you have and you can put that into the words that you put on the page, people are going to be interested to read that. But to some extent, you also have to consider who your readers are too, Mm. because they have different needs. Some people, Tom Smith used to call activity books, cookbooks. Here's an activity. Here's how you do it. Go. So when I wrote Extraordinary Facilitation, I wanted to give a little bit more of the philosophy behind the ideas. Mm. I think one of the things that happens at this point in my career is I want to leave a bread 
breadcrumb trail behind me so that other people can follow in the path. Mm. You know, they can find their way along that trail too. Because the nice thing about our industry is there's room for a lot more voices than we currently have. You know, I think there's room for more books, for more innovative kind of activities and things like that. So um, when you're ready, um, and I'm, I'm kind of posing this to the, the listeners of this podcast, when you're ready, there, there's room for your voice to be heard out there. And if you're not sure how to begin, give Mark a call or myself, and uh, we'll be glad to talk you through at least what our technique was for getting there. Love it. Final thoughts and where can people find you? So we'll do where can people find you first? Um, my website's teamworkandteamplay.com. Uh, and you can connect to me through that. Um, I think most of my books are available on Amazon and you'll find write-ups and things there. And the American Camp Association Bookstore has a lot of those. And so does Michelle Cummings at Training Wheels. In fact, she carries not only the books that I've written, but some of the props and things we've created that we use in our team building programs. So those are the best ways. And um, my email is jimkane at teamworkandteamplay.com. And we'll include all of the different references and books and contact information in the show notes. Folks can see that in the description of the podcast. So final thoughts, Jim. I'm excited about the future. This idea of rebuilding and reconnecting in our post-pandemic world. I've gotten invitations to travel internationally again, which is exciting for me. So I hope, I hope that as the pandemic winds down, I believe this is true. What we do as facilitators we are in a position to do more good in the coming year than we have ever done before by helping people to reconnect and re-engage and rebuild in a post-pandemic world. And I'm excited about those possibilities. Love it. My guest today has been Dr. Jim Kane, team building guru, author of 28 different books, including <laughs> Extraordinary Facilitation, and just someone I'm very thankful for personally, just how much I've learned from him and just what a wonderful friend he is. So when uh, y'all might not know that when I decided to start Workplace Solutions, Jim was the first person to call me and said, congratulations on the, the rest of your life. So thankful for your support and and to have you on the podcast today so thanks for being here today jim my pleasure if you enjoy this podcast please leave a review tell a friend give us a gold star or call my grandma and if you want unforgettable events and training that's fun like for real fun get started today at workplaysolutions.com i know i want that <laughs> Boo -boo -boo.